Welcome back, and thanks for joining us for Two Steps Forward, our daily Bible study. We are up to episode 161 in Judges chapter 8. And uh, anything in Judges here that you want to touch on, Aid, before we jump into our paraphrase? <laughs> um, I was going to ask you, in the last chapter, it's... I, th- I don't think it said in the chapter, but my Bible said that the mountain they were on was Mount Gilead. Oh, yeah. So I was just wondering, do you know what that word means? Yes and no. So Gilead, I know, refers to the region that is Transjordan. So most of the action in Israel, like the city of Jerusalem and stuff, is all on the western side Mm -hmm. of uh, the Jordan River. So between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. Mm -hmm. However, if you cross the Jordan River, you go the other side is where most of Israel's enemies are. And it's also where three tribes are. So Manasseh and, if I'm remembering correctly, Dan and Reuben. Um, But they are, collectively, that region, Transjordan, is known as Gilead. So the reason I was asking is there's this, like, dystopian book, and now it's a TV show, and they make a new society that's extremely, like, repressive to women and regressive in a lot of ways, and it's called Gilead. Mm Mm-hmm. So I was just wondering if that was, if that's a commentary on what it's, what the author, how the author perceives the Bible to. Yeah, that's it's interesting. I don't know. I have heard that before, even without knowing much about the series. Um, and I don't know, because it can mean a couple different things, theoretically. Uh, Gilead is, again, the fact that it's Transjordan means it's kind of on the outskirts or something different from the, the normal Israel. Uh, so it could mean something about that. There, there are other um, implications attached to Gilead. There's a song, uh, like a ancient, uh, not an ancient hymn, but a kind of famous hymn called Balm and Gilead mm-hmm. that we sometimes sing. There, it could mean a couple different things. And so I don't know exactly what they're referring to without having fully seen the series or let them talk about the city itself or whatever, mm-hmm. the region yeah. itself. So, um, But make sure to read through your copy of Judges chapter 8 at home. Uh, we're still on uh, Gideon's kind of exploits here, and he is post not he hasn't finished off the victory against the Midianites yet, uh, but that's the direction we're heading in. So the Ephraimites, which are by the way the twin tribe uh, to Manasseh, Gideon is in Manasseh, and they're if you remember Joseph's sons, Joseph didn't have a tribe named after him, but he had uh, sons. Ephraim and Manasseh, and he would get essentially two tribal lands in the promised land. So uh, the Ephraimites consider themselves especially close to Manasseh. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Ephraimites challenged Gideon as to why he didn't consult them when he was t- attacking the Midianites. They said that they would like would have liked to take part in all this. And it probably is because they're just jealous of the spoils that Gideon is getting in victory mm-hmm. here over um, the Midianites. But uh, Gideon reminded them how God was the one who's determining who's winning the battles, and eventually their resentment sort of goes away. Gideon and his 300 troops were exhausted, but still in pursuit of the Midianites. They were hungry, but the men of Succoth uh, were stingy about helping Gideon's troops by giving them bread. He, in other words, he requested some help from them. They refused to give it. Uh, he said that for their insolence, they were going to have their flesh torn from them as soon as the enemies were captured. Gideon got the same kind of response from a city called Peniel. Gideon kept pursuing the Midianites and other eastern peoples. It was not just Midianites, but I think it was the Amorites in there and some other eastern groups, um, kind of a, a, a band of troops together, led by two individuals named Ziba and Zalmunna. Uh, but the number had gone all the way down to 15,000. They had 120,000 soldiers, uh, sorry, 135,000 who before, 120,000 of them had died, and they're down to just a fraction of what they once were. And Gideon eventually kills them all. Gideon came back and taught a lesson then to the stubborn leaders of Succoth and Peniel, where we're told that he taught them a lesson by punishing them with desert thorns and briars, which seems to mean that he did something like tortured them before he killed them. He pushed them down on thorns and briars and like scraped them and tore up their flesh, and then they eventually died, which is kind of a weird thing to think of one of God's judges doing to people, actually torturing them here. Uh, He also did a bunch of damage to their towns and and destroyed the fields and that sort of thing. Ziba and Zalmona had told Gideon that they killed his brothers at Tabor, 
uh, these are again the Midianite Eastern peoples, mm-hmm. said they had killed his brothers. And Gideon told his oldest son then to defend the family and kill these guys. And Jether, the son, was who's still a boy at the time, doesn't really want to do it, doesn't have the stomach for it. And so Gideon goes and kills him himself. The Israelites tried to get Gideon to rule over them as a king after defeating the Midianites. So he's clearly kind of a legend in Israel. And Gideon said he wasn't going to do that because the Lord had made it very clear he was the king in Israel. And mm-hmm. Israel was different from the other nations because it had no king. Their king was, was the Lord God. But uh, in his compromising, Gideon did say, but I'll take some of your additional plunder from you. And so he asks for a, an earring from each of the individuals um, that received some plunder. He accumulates 43 pounds of gold. And with that gold, he turns it into an ephod. Uh, which is a priestly kind of garment that he sets up as a shrine, not shrine like intending to worship, but allowing it to be worshipped. Kind of a lasting, think of it like a statue honoring his glory. And he allows that to be set up in his hometown of Orpha. And we're told that the Israelites then often traveled to Orpha and prostituted themselves by worshipping it there. And it was a snare to Gideon's family. So So this is bad. This is bad. Everybody do that. Because Gideon, so Gideon thinks he's being noble, and in some respects is being noble by refusing to be considered king. So he he refuses to become king, but he nonetheless lives like a king, Mm. and that's a problem. Um, Refusing to take the title, but then taking all the spoils of the title is just as bad as taking the title itself. Mm -hmm. And Gideon, remember, we said this last time too, God is saving Israel through Gideon, not because of Gideon's faithfulness, but despite Gideon's constant weaknesses Mm -hmm. Um, we're going to see this as the judges continue to progress it's part of the theme of judges is um even their leaders are really kind of miserable people Mm -hmm. in some respects well okay so the land has peace after this victory for 40 years uh which is during gideon's lifetime but gideon had many wives another sign of lack of kind of faithfulness here uh, and at least one concubine we're told that he has 70 sons which means he probably has about 150 kids After Gideon died, the Israelites again prostituted themselves to the Baals, specifically to a variation of Baal called Baal Berith. Uh, They were told that they forgot what the Lord had done for them, and they forgot uh, Gideon's family at all in all of this. Mm -hmm. All right, Judges 8. Any initial reaction? Um, My friend has a boyfriend who's not at all interested in Christianity, Mm -hmm. and he told her that if she was raised believing Harry Potter to be true, then she would believe that was true. Like, basically, you were force-fed this fantastical story. Yes, you're a product of your environment and your culture. And her parents were really offended, as they should be. But then when I hear this, I'm like, this also does sound like... A little crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, what makes fiction fiction? Is fiction fiction because it's fantastic or is it fiction because it didn't happen? You know, and I I mentioned this last week uh, in my sermon Mm -hmm. when I kind of said a lot of people have scolded me for using the word story Mm -hmm. to describe the gospel. And I explained, actually, it's a much bigger problem if you don't use the word story to describe the gospel, because if it's not a story then it is just a compendium of Jesus' teachings that you must obey. And then the inference is that like salvation comes by either becoming obedient to his teachings or at least rightly aligning in doctrine his teachings. Whereas if it's a story, it's something he did mm-hmm. for you rather than something he's giving you advice to do. It's good news, not good advice, if it's the gospel as a story. And actually, the Greek word that's used to describe uh, it is a word that essentially means narration. A story is a story because it has a narrative arc, mm-hmm. not because it's untrue. Yeah, but you know why people say that? Because people use the word story. Like, you wouldn't read about the Berlin Wall coming down and be like, oh, that was a great story. <coughs> it's just... We all have stories about our childhood yeah. that doesn't make them untrue. And we have to be very careful. As Christians, you got to be really careful with your words. Words matter. Words shape thoughts and visions and all that. And a story is not a story because it's fictional. A story is a story because it has a narrative arc. It's true that there are many stories that are fictional and are untrue, uh, but essentially, again, it just has a narrative arc. The same thing is true here with saying, okay, is this history or not? History is I didn't say it wasn't history. No, I know, but that's what the criticism would be. I'm just saying it sounds a little crazy. Yes, because it's fantastic. 
it's fantastic history, right? Do you mean fantastic like it didn't happen? It's fantasy? No, I mean fantastic as in it's extraordinary and it's out of the realm of normal mm-hmm. and that sort of thing. Like, so the idea of 300 men mm-hmm. defeating an army of uh, 150,000 mm-hmm. is like that doesn't happen, mm-hmm. but it could happen. And that's the point. Like, we all know that it could happen with mm-hmm. the right decisions and the right uh, courage and the right methodology and, and divine you know, assistance and involvement, it can happen. And so that's the point. Just because something's unlikely doesn't make it not history, mm-hmm. is I guess what I'm saying. You know what I mean? Yeah. Of course the Bible is is has um, incredible, fantastic, extraordinary stories. That doesn't make them untrue, even though we associate the fantastic and the extraordinary with things like science fiction mm-hmm. and fantasy. Yeah. You know, so. But I have heard that... Um, I have heard that argument a lot. And it's, for that matter, I've heard the cultural, you're just a product of your culture, too. Mm-hmm. Which is another good reason why Christians have to make sure that their belief isn't simply the product of their culture. So you shouldn't be ready to give a reason for the hope that you have. Don't just be a Christian because, well, my parents were Christians and my mm-hmm. my I went to a Christian school and etc. So, all right. Anyway, some devotional thoughts for today. Number one, the courage to be a manly leader. And this is going to be, I don't know how chauvinistic this is going to sound or not, but... Um, Can't wait to hear it. <laughs> Gideon's kind of a brutal guy. Mm-hmm. And actually, he tortures these individuals from Succoth and Peniel for disrespecting God and God's will. Mm-hmm. And probably dis- and disrespecting his soldiers in the process. Um, he is insulted and he actually tells his son, he's training his son to kill mm-hmm. and avenge their family's death by killing these leaders of the Midianites. And the son won't do it. And it, the, the Midianite leaders actually in the text, they sort of say, uh, you know, they kind of insult him in the process. Mm-hmm. Are you man enough to even do this? And so what they're getting at, even though there is such a thing as toxic masculinity mm-hmm. and there is such a thing as an oppressive patriarchy, being male in and of itself and being, for that matter, um, a fighting male is not a bad thing. And actually, God is using it here as a good thing. It can be abused, of course, but the idea of like hyper physicality in men or even potentially violence is not inherently bad. It's bad if it's selfish and sinful and oppressive and all that stuff. But sometimes it's just somebody you need somebody to have the courage to ha- and have the guts to uh, fight back. Take a swing. So sometimes take a you shot. don't just turn the other cheek. Correct. Yes. So if you if you were getting beaten up mm-hmm. by some guy, you know, who broke into our house or whatever, I would punch him in the face. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't encourage you to turn the other cheek. If he was punching me, I might say, okay, uh, I rather than resort to violence myself, I, I might. But if he's uh, taking advantage of somebody weaker, I have to use my God-given ability to protect. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we see God having his people do that. And for that matter, the judges, that's what they do the entire time. They protect God's people who are God's children because enemies are invading their house and oppressing their people. And God says, nope, that's not okay. You know, you're not going to do that to my family. And because part of the long-term reason of that, that isn't God being selfish either. The long-term reason for that in destroying an enemy uh, would be, so if if I kill somebody who is going to kill a bunch of other people, you know, mm-hmm. um, what I'm doing is I'm actually, yes, using destruction and using violence, but it's stopping other violence. So if you, when God is wiping out these, we talked about this before, when the Israelites go in and they're supposed to wipe out all of their enemies, Mm -hmm. the idea is those enemies are already engaging in child sacrifice. Like in the world wars. Yeah, right. Yes. Is is there such a thing as a righteous war? Yes. Um, But those, the people, the Canaanites were guilty of child sacrifice. They were guilty of uh, temple prostitution and, and the oppression of men and women sexually. And God says, yeah, that's not okay. And they're going to continue to perpetuate that. So you need to go in and completely destroy them. Mm -hmm. And so I I think one of my favorite examples of this in modern like narration, Mm -hmm. and you probably know where I'm going with this because I bring this example out every once in a while. But when we watched The Walking Dead, Mm -hmm. uh, when I I was doing leading a men's group, 
uh, we would talk about leadership, and I use this as an illustration sometimes, but Rick was the main character on The Walking Dead. In the second season, the, the entire second season is them just kind of wandering around looking for a little girl, which mm-hmm. is, I forget the character's name, um, Carol is the Carol's mom. Daughter, yeah. It's Carol's daughter. Uh, they're wandering around looking for her and can't find her, can't find her, can't find her. That's like the first, whatever, six, eight episodes of the that, mm-hmm. that part of the season. And the mid-season finale is essentially they find her on, like, in the barn of the home that they're staying at. Mm-hmm. And she walks out and she's a zombie. And everybody up until this point has been questioning Rick's leadership. And they said, if you were a better leader, I should be leading because when you lead, this happens. And you should lead like this. And you should lead like that. And then when Carol's daughter, who's now a zombie, walks out and tries to kill them, everybody looks at her as Carol's daughter. Mm-hmm. And they won't do anything. No one will fight against her. No one will, you know, do whatever you got to do to kill a zombie, you know, impale it or shoot it in the head or whatever. And finally, they like the camera zooms around to every other character there. And finally it lands on Rick and Rick pulls out his gun and he shoots her in the head because she's a zombie at that point, not a child. But the point is, and what they're trying to say is Rick is the only buddy that actually had the guts to pull the trigger for the benefit of the group. And that is an mm-hmm. aspect of leadership. And that is that aspect of manliness, too. And God wired men to be able to do things like that and not like that they should be able to do stuff like that. I'm not saying that women can't do stuff like that. I'm not saying that all men naturally feel like they can do stuff like that. But it is a trait of a godly male leader, not violence, Mm -hmm. but righteous indignation and protection when necessary. Yeah. Okay. So people can fire back at me in the comment section about that if they don't like any of that stuff. But um i wish by the way i'm not i kind of <laughs> i'm kind of famously online not a big gun advocate uh mm-hmm. and i've taken heat for that too but um I, that doesn't mean that i'm against manly toughness or courage mm-hmm. okay so uh number two celebrity worship the jews wanted to establish gideon as a king and for theological reasons gideon says no and in fact there's um a great spot, Miriam's son in Exodus 15, she talks about the Lord, our King. And even in the tabernacle, the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant was mm-hmm. the mercy. It's a seat. It's the throne. It's mm-hmm. the throne of God. And the, the idea, the concept is God sits on his throne in Israel. He's our king. We wouldn't want another throne. We don't want another king because we wouldn't want them to take away from worship of the true God. And so Gideon has this idea that like, oh yeah, I can't serve as God. God would not be okay with that. But where he compromises in his head, and this is where a lot of Christian mistakes come, is like compromise. Uh, it's it's like, I'm not completely all in on this concept and my flesh still wants to get its own. Mm-hmm. And so what he says is, but I'll take some of your money mm-hmm. and you can bring me your gold ornaments. And he takes their earrings. We're told he gets 43 pounds of gold that he burns and melts into a golden ephod, which is a priestly garment. Gideon's not a priest. He's not from the tribe of Levi or anything like that. Uh, He should not have an ephod that way. And for that matter, he doesn't need a golden one. And for that matter, he also sets it up in his hometown of Orpha and fully is okay with people coming and worshiping it and him there, Mm -hmm. which very clearly is idolatry. And what it specifically says in the text is they prostitute themselves to it, which any idolatry is a form of unfaithfulness to God. Looking to the things of this world to give you the hope, meaning, security, and purpose that only God himself can give you. The Bible considers that cheating on God. And uh, I think the point then is that no human... Like the temptation is always there. No human should ever try to take credit that belongs to God. And yet fallen humans always, I don't know what it is with us. We love celebrities. We love whether they're athletes or they are. Why is it so important to take a picture of somebody with you and post it on your social media? Mm -hmm. Why is it so important to get an autograph? Like the name, somebody writes their name on something. Why is that a deal to us? Because we have this weird sinful wiring for celebrity worship. I'm not saying all autographs or all pictures are are wrong. I'm not saying that. I'm saying the impulse of humans to elevate other humans to the Mm -hmm. level of God is there's something weird and off and wrong about that. And for that matter, allowing people to do it to us. All right, devotional thought number three, living like a king. We're told that despite the fact that Gideon rejects the formal offer of becoming like king in Israel because he knows that he's not supposed to do that, 
Um, he nonetheless acts like a king in many different ways. So for instance, we're told that he takes many wives and that's very clearly a problem. It's interesting how some Israelites decide to have more wives. So like Joseph had two sons, you just said, e- mm-hmm. e- Ephraim and Manasseh. Yep. Okay, so he probably had one wife. Yes. Like, so, so he had one wife. I mean, and some of them just decide, no, I'm going to have more than one wife. Yeah. The guys who... I remember hearing once that the guys who end up looking the best in the Old Testament tend to be Joseph and Daniel. And uh, so those seem to be like one woman men. Like those are the guys who, while not perfect, Mm -hmm. they are most consistently obedient to God. Um, And even, you know, David uh, struggles with this. And certainly the other kings in Israel struggle with this. And then, okay, so clearly judges. He, didn't he have a wife when he took the other wife? He was a bachelor until that. I don't know who's he, who he is. David. He had multiple wives. Yeah. Yeah. So, but but the point is, yes, a lot. Sorry, of, you said Joseph and Daniel, not David. Yeah. They had, the, in other words, a lot of leaders in the patriarchy mm-hmm. struggle with this too. And so, so much of this tends to be culturally conditioned. Um, anytime a behavior is really normalized in a society, the behavior tends to spike. So if polygamy is a normalized behavior, God's people in the midst of a culture where there's the prevalence of polygamy, what they tend to do is it's the same compromise kind of thing that we were just talking about that like they tend to say, well, we don't have shrine prostitutes. Mm -hmm. So as long as we're faithful to our multiple wives, we're doing pretty good, Mm -hmm. you know? So it's like not God's intention, but it's also not the uh, gross paganism of society. Mm -hmm. It's like somewhere in between. And I think that's in a lot of their minds. That's how they kind of justify as long as I'm taking care of my kids, as long as I'm being faithful to like my multiple wives. As long as we are engaged to be married, then we can have sex. It's exactly. Live together. Yeah. Right. Yes. We're monogamous. Mm-hmm. We're all, we're only, you know, committed to each other. We're not married, but you know, like it's exactly what people still struggle with today. It's that like compromising in their head kind of thing. And so, however, it never goes without bad results. Um, and that's the, the consistent, um, Robert Alter, I've mentioned him before in the, the art of biggle narrative. He's a Hebrew professor at, uh, UCAL Berkeley, but he talks about essentially the, what's being talked, taught through the literature of the Bible, the narrative of the Bible. And one of the things that he would say is if you think that, um, God is okay with polygamy in the old Testament, you're not reading the old Testament correctly because every time it happens, there's always a catastrophe attached mm-hmm. to it. Uh, so it never works out well. The There's infighting in the family. There's... Even on TV, it doesn't work out well. Those <laughs> sister wives are always at each other. I, I don't know about that, but I would assume that that would be the case because it, it's a violation of God's like clear design here. And so, yes, he has many wives, many children, a great deal of money now from the plunder. And he actually, not not only does he have lots of wives, he has a concubine. Like, as though many wives were not enough, where uh, she's some kind of like slave woman who bears him a child. Mm-hmm. And that child's name is Abimelech, which, interestingly enough, here's here's where the Hebrew sort of helps you out. The name Abimelech in Hebrew means my father is king. Mm. So, fascinatingly, even though Gideon formally rejected the offer of kingship, he's functioning like the king in his own little world here. He makes himself an ephod, which again, he doesn't have the right to do because he's not a priest. Um, it's a priestly garment. It's This one's made of gold. And Gideon, I, another interesting point of this is Gideon probably thinks that he's securing his family's future by absorbing all this money. People think the same way today, right? Mm-hmm. I can provide for my generations down the line. I can secure my family by making sure they have enough financial, you know, uh, mm-hmm. finance to, to take care of them. His, his future falls apart. 69 of his 70 sons are going to get killed by the half-brother who is the son of the concubine. So Abimelech mm-hmm. is going to end up killing his other brothers. And so I, I think the lesson here is there's no security apart from God. Mm-hmm. Like you think you're living like a king. You're living, um, you know, you got all the money in the world to take care of your family and your future and your whatever else. You're not secure apart from God. And to find God's will, he's going to, there's, there's going to be some kind of discipline that comes out of that that's just not good. So um, find your security solely in his promises, not in your beauty, not in your intelligence, not in your friends, not in your, how much money you got in your bank account. Find yeah. your security only in him. 
Any final thoughts? No, it definitely is easy to think the more money you make, the more... Secure, yeah. Yeah. Like, people even talk about, like, oh, you should take this job because they invest 22% in your retirement. Yeah. Which, and the balance to that... Versus whatever. Right. Which the balance balance to that is that it is wise to plan for your future. Mm -hmm. The problem is, so it's, it's ever... I, someday I want to turn this into a book somehow. But like people are always trying to turn things into the binary of black and white. Yeah. Black and white. And there's almost always a third avenue here. Well, the other thing is you can... Um, it's not just for like your future, though. Like I know pe- a lot of Christians who have given their money posthumously. Humously. <laughs> okay, as soon as I said it, I without, knew it wasn't... <laughs> they've given their money without any, la- any laughter whatsoever. <laughs> Very stoically. Which we they have donated. They were trying to get big laughs from it. <laughs> yeah. Have left their like money in their wills to certain churches or yeah, whatever. Yeah. You know, so that you can use your wealth your you can invest wisely so that you even have more to like propel the gospel in yes. the future. Yep. Yes, there are all sorts of great ways to plan with your money mm-hmm. and to save your money and invest your money and use your money to, to uh, proclaim the gospel. The temptation is always, it's, it's exactly what we were talking about earlier with, okay, confidence. Should To what degree should I have confidence in my personal gifts that God has given me yeah. versus the promises of God? It's not that you shouldn't have confidence in the gifts that he's given you. It's that you got to be careful not to turn those things into your security. Mm-hmm. God, gifts from God are not the same thing as God. And the main misstep of idolatry is to look at gifts from God as God. So your money can't secure you, only God can. You're, nothing about you can save you, only Jesus can. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's always this fine, fine line that we, like it's the same trick over and over that Satan gets us to fall for, loving the blessing ahead of the blesser. But um, Gideon has fallen for it here, and he's a judge in Israel. And if it can happen to him, it certainly can happen to us. You know. So, all right, let's close the prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you again for our walk through Judges. There's so much to learn from Gideon's life. And more than anything, I think, as I see him make mistakes, and yet you're patient with him, and you bless him, and even just the littlest bit of faith that you gave to him, even as you reaffirmed to him and reassured that little faith, you accomplished extraordinary things through it. Lord, we have far less faith than what we'd like to have. Uh, So grow our faith. Help us trust your promises. Help us take our eyes off ourselves and put them securely on you where we find all our security. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for studying with us. We will see you tomorrow for Judges chapter 9.